A Belated Violet by Oliver Hereford Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes Very dark the summer sky, dark the clouds that hurried by, Very rough the autumn breeze, shouting rudely to the trees, Listening, frightened, pale and cold, Through the withered leaves and mould peered a violet all in dread. Where, oh, where is spring? she said. Sighed the trees, poor little thing, she may call in vain for spring. And the grasses whispered low, we must never let her know. What's this whispering? roared the breeze. Hush, a violet, sobbed the trees, thinks it's spring. Poor child, we fear she will die if she should hear. Softly stole the wind away, tenderly, he murmured, stay, to a late thrush on the wing, stay with her one day and sing. Sang the thrush so sweet and clear that the sun came out to hear, and in answer to her song beamed on violet all day long, and the last leaves here and there fluttered with a spring-like air. Then the violet raised her head. Spring has come at last, she said. Happy dreams had violet all that night, but happier yet, when the dawn came dark with snow, violet never woke to know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Break, Break, Break by Alfred Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Arctra Break, break, break On thy cold grey stones, O sea And I would that my tongue could utter The thoughts that arise in me Oh, well for the fisherman's boy That he shouts with his sister at play Oh, well for the sailor lad that he sings in his boat on the bay. And the stately ships go on to their haven under the hill. But oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. Break, break, break at the foot of thy crags, O sea. The tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Disillusionment of Ten O'Clock by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake Of Long Branch, New Jersey The houses are haunted by white nightgowns. None are green, or purple with green rings, or green with yellow rings, or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange with socks of lace and beaded censures. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only, here and there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in red weather. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Emperor of Ice Cream by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake Call the roller of big cigars, the muscular one, and bid him whip in kitchen cups concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they are used to wear, 
and let the boys bring flowers in last month's newspapers. Let B be the finale of seam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Take from the dresser of deal, lacking the three glass knobs, that sheet on which she embroidered fantails once, and spread it so as to cover her face. If her horny feet protrude, they come to show how cold she is, and dumb. Let the lamp affix its beam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Emperor of Ice Cream by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Drake Call the roller of big cigars, the muscular one, and bid him whip in kitchen cups concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they are used to wear, and let the boys bring flowers in last month's newspapers. Let B be the finale of seam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Take from the dresser of deal, lacking the three glass knobs, that sheet on which she embroidered fantails once, and spread it so as to cover her face. If her horny feet protrude, they come to show how cold she is, and dumb. Let the lamp affix its beam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fancy by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes Ever let the fancy roam, pleasure never is at home. At a touch sweet pleasure melteth, like to bubbles when rain pelteth. Then let winged fancy wander through the thought still spread beyond her. Open wide the mind's cage door, she'll dart forth and cloudward soar. O oh, sweet fancy, let her loose. Summer's joys are spoilt by use, And the enjoying of the spring Fades as does its blossoming. Autumn's red-lipped fruitage, too, Blushing through the mist and dew, Cloys with tasting. What do then? Sit thee by the ingle, When the searing faggot blazes bright, Spirit of a winter's night. When the soundless earth is muffled, and the caked snow is shuffled from the ploughboy's heavy shoon, when the night doth meet the noon in a dark conspiracy to banish even from her sky. Sit thee there and send abroad with a mind self overawed, fancy, high commissioned, send her. She has vassals to attend her. She will bring, in spite of frost, beauties that the earth hath lost. She will bring thee all together, all delights of summer weather, all the buds and bells of May, from dewy sward or thorny spray, all the heaped autumn's wealth, with a still mysterious stealth. She will mix these pleasures up like three fit wines in a cup, and thou shalt quaff it. Thou shalt hear distant harvest carolers clear, rustle of the reaped corn. Sweet birds anthemming the morn, and in the same moment, hark, tis the early April lark, or the rook with busy caw, foraging for sticks and straw. Thou shalt at one glance behold the daisy and the marigold, white plumed lilies, and the first hedge grown primrose hath burst, shaded hyacinth. Alway sapphire queen of the mid-May, And every leaf and every flower Pearled with the self-same shower, 
Thou shalt see the field mouse peep, meagre from its cell deep, and the snake all winter thin cast on sunny bank its skin. Freckled nest eggs thou shalt see, hatching in the hawthorn tree, when the hen bird's wing doth rest quiet on her mossy nest. Then the hurry and alarm, when the beehive casts its swarm, acorns ripe down pattering, while the autumn breezes sing. O oh, sweet fancy, let her loose, everything is spoilt by use. Where's the cheek that doth not fade too much gazed at? Where's the mind whose lip mature is ever new? Where's the eye, however blue, doth not weary? Where's the face one would meet in every place? Where's the voice, however soft, one would hear so very oft? At a touch sweet pleasure melteth like bubbles when rain pelteth. Let then winged fancy find thee a mistress to thy mind, dulcet-eyed as Ceres' daughter, ere the god of torment taught her how to frown and how to chide. With a waist and with a side white as Hebe's, when her zone slipped its golden clasp and down fell her kirtle to her feet, while she held the goblet sweet. And Jove grew languid. Break the mesh of the fancy's silken leash. Quickly break her prison string, and such joys as these she'll bring. Let the winged fancy roam. Pleasure never is at home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A fragment from Parmenides, translated by Arthur Fairbanks, read for LibriVox.org. The horses which bear me conducted me as far as desire may go when they had brought me speeding along to the far-famed road of a divinity who herself bears onward through all things the man of understanding. Along this road I was born, along this the horses, wise indeed, bore me, hastening the chariot on, and maidens guided my course. The axle in its box, enkindled by the heat, uttered the sound of a pipe, for it was driven on by the rolling wheels on either side. When the maiden daughters of Helios hastened to conduct me to the light, leaving the realms of night, pushing aside with a hand the veils from their heads. There is the gate between the ways of day and night. Lintel above it and stone threshold beneath hold it in place, and high in air it is fitted with great doors. Retributive of justice holds the keys that open and shut them. However, the maidens addressed her with mild words, and found means to persuade her to thrust back speedily for them the fastened bolt from the doors, and the gate, swinging free, made the opening wide, turning in their sockets the bronze hinges, well fastened with bolts and nails. Then through this the maidens kept horses and chariots straight on the high road. The goddess received me with kindness, and taking my right hand in hers, she addressed me with these words. Youth, joined with drivers immortal, who hast come with the horses that bear thee to our dwelling, hail, since no evil fate has bid thee come on this road, for it lies far outside the beaten track of men, but right and justice. Tis necessary for thee to learn all things, both the abiding essence of persuasive truth and men's opinions, in which rests no true belief. But nevertheless, these things also thou shalt learn, since it is necessary to judge accurately the things that rest on opinion, passing all things carefully in review. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. France by Cecil Chesterton Because for once the sword broke in her hand, 
the words she spoke seemed perished for a space. All wrong was brazen, and in every land the tyrants walked abroad with naked face. The waters turned to blood, and rose the star of evil fate denying all release. The rulers smote, the feeble crying, war. The usurers robbed, the naked crying, peace. And her feet were caught in nets of gold, and her own soul profaned by sects of that squirm. And little men climbed her high seas and sold her honor to the vulture and the worm. And she seemed broken, and they thought her dead, the overmen so brave against the weak. Has your last word of sophistry been said, O cult of slaves, when it is hers to speak? Clear the slow mist from her half-darkened eyes, as slow mist parted over Valmy fell, as once her hands in high surprise take hold upon the battlements of hell. End of France by Cecil Chesterton From the Shore by Carl Sandburg, Read for LibriVox.org by Cody Logan Alone, gray bird, dim-dipping, far-flying, Alone in the shadows and grandeurs and tumults Of night and the sea and the stars and the storms. Out over the darkness it wavers and hovers, Out into the gloom it swings and batters, Out into the wind and the rain and the vast, Out into the pit of a great black world, Where fogs are at battle, sky-driven, sea-blown, Love of mist and rapture of flight, Glories of chance and hazards of death, On its eager and palpitant wings. Out into the deep of the great dark world, Beyond long borders where foam and drift Of the sundering waves are lost and gone, On the tides that plunge and rear and crumble. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gypsy Girl by Ralph Hodgson Come, try your skill, kind gentlemen. A penny for three tries. Some through and lost, some through and won. A ten a penny prize. She was a tawny gypsy girl, a girl of twenty years. I liked her for the lumps of gold that jingled from her ears. I liked the flaring yellow scarf bound loose about her throat. I liked her showy purple gown and flashy velvet coat. A man came up to loose of tongue and said no good to her. She did not blush as Saxons do or turn upon the cur. She fawned and whined, Sweet gentlemen, a penny for three tries. But oh, the den of wild things and the darkness of her eyes. The Hangman at Home by Carl Sandburg Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Drake What does the hangman think about when he goes home at night from work, when he sits down with his wife and children for a cup of coffee and a plate of ham and eggs? Do they ask him if it was a good day's work and everything went well, or do they stay off some topics and talk about the weather, baseball, politics, and the comic strips in the papers and the movies? Do they look at his hands when he reaches for the coffee or the ham and eggs? If the little ones say, Daddy, play horse, here's a rope, does he answer like a joke? I've seen enough rope for today. Or does his face light up like a bonfire of joy, and does he say, It's a good and dandy world we live in? And if a white-faced moon looks in through a window where a baby girl sleeps, and the moon gleams mix with baby ears and baby hair, the hangman, how does he act then? It must be easy for him. Anything is easy for a hangman, I guess. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
I Who Laughed My Youth Away by William Griffith, read for LibriVox.org. I who laughed my youth away, and blew bubbles to the sky, thin as air and frail as fire, opals pearls of such desire as a saint could but admire. Now, as azure as a sigh, then with passion all aglow, gold and crimson purple gray, moods and moments of a day, have been gay, yea, as they. Sailing high, sinking low, even so, Pierrot. Walking Paris in a trance, with my weary feet in France, and my heart in Bergamo, loved and lost my laughing way. I, of course, have never had any great amount of gold, other than my bubbles hold. Love, I have no loving plan, as a guide to beast or man, being neither good nor bad, just a sort of sorry lad. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mending Wall by Robert Frost. Read for LibriVox.org by Julian Jameson. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them, and made repair, where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding, to please the yelping dogs. The gaps I mean, no one has seen them made, or heard them made, but at spring mending time we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, Good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in, or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, Good fences make good neighbors. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. October by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Toria's Uncle October is the treasurer of the year, and all the months pay bounty to her store. The fields and orchards still their tribute bear, and fill her brimming coffers more and more. But she, with youthful lavishness, spends all her wealth in gaudy dress, and decks herself in garments bold of scarlet, purple, red, and gold. She heedeth not how swift the hours fly, but smiles and sings her happy life along. 
She only sees above a shining sky. She only hears the breeze's voice in song. Her garments trail the woodlands through and gather pearls of early dew that sparkle till the roguish sun creeps up and steals them every one. But what cares she that jewels should be lost when all of nature's bounteous wealth is hers? Though princely fortunes may have been their cost, not one regret her calm demeanor stirs. Wholehearted, happy, careless, free, she lives her life out joyously. Nor cares when frost stalks o'er her way and turns her auburn locks to gray. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Snowman by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake Of Long Branch, New Jersey One must have a mind of winter To regard the frost and the boughs Of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing the same bare place for the listener who listens in the snow, and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there, and the nothing that is. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake of Long Branch, New Jersey. 1. Among twenty snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. 2. I was of three minds, like a tree in which there were three blackbirds. Three, the blackbird whirled in the autumn wind. It was a small part of the pantomime. Four, a man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. Five, I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections, or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling, or just after. 6. Icicles fill the window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. 7. O thin men of Hadam, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? 8. I know noble accents and lucid inescapable rhythms, but I know, too, that the blackbird is involved in what I know. 9. When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. 10. At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the bawds of euphony would cry out sharply. 11. He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once, a fear pierced him, in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. 
Twelve. The river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. Thirteen. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing, and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Time, Real and Imaginary, an Allegory by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Julian Jameson. On the wide level of a mountain's head, I knew not where, but twas some fairy place, their pinions, ostrich like, for sails outspread, two lovely children run an endless race, a sister and a brother. This far outstripped the other, yet ever runs she with reverted face, and looks and listens for the boy behind, for he, alas, is blind. O'er rough and smooth with even step he passed, and knows not whether he be first or last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Anthea, Who May Command Him Anything, by Robert Herrick. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes. Bid me to live, and I will live, thy Protestant to be. Or bid me love, and I will give a loving heart to thee. A heart as soft, a heart as kind, a heart as sound and free as in the whole world thou canst find. That heart I'll give to thee. Bid that heart stay, and it will stay, to honour thy decree or bid it languish quite away, and it shall do so for thee. Bid me to weep, and I will weep while I have eyes to see, and having none, yet I will keep a heart to weep for thee. Bid me despair, and I'll despair under that cypress tree, or bid me die, and I will dare even death to die for thee. Thou art my life, my love, my heart, the very eyes of me, and hast command of every part to live and die for thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To F. W. By William Ernest Henley. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes. Let us be drunk and for a while forget. Forget and ceasing, even from regret, live without reason and despite of rhyme, as in a dream preposterous and sublime, where place and hour and means for once are met. Where is the use of effort? Love and debt and disappointment have us in a net. Let us break out and taste the morning prime. Let us be drunk. In vain our little hour we strut and fret, And mouth our wretched parts as for a bet. We cannot please the tragic hast of time. To gain the crystal sphere, the silver dime, Where sympathy sits dimpling on us yet. Let us be drunk. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Hope by John Keats. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes. When by my solitary hearth I sit, when no fair dreams before my mind's eye flit, and the bare heath of life presents no bloom. Sweet hope, ethereal balm upon me shed, And wave thy silver pinions o'er my head. 
Whene'er I wander at the fall of night, Where woven boughs shut out the moon's bright ray, Should sad despondency my musings fright, And frown to drive fair cheerfulness away, Peep with the moonbeams through the leafy roof, And keep that fiend despondence far aloof. Should disappointment, parent of despair, Strive for her son to seize my careless heart, when like a cloud he sits upon the air, Preparing on his spell-bound prey to dart. Chase him away, sweet hope, with visage bright, And frighten him as the morning frightens night. Whene'er the fate of those I hold most dear Tells to my fearful breast a tale of sorrow, O bright-eyed hope, my morbid fancy cheer, Let me a while thy sweetest comforts borrow. Thy heaven-born radiance around me shed, And wave thy silver pinions o'er my head. Should e'er unhappy love my bosom pain, From cruel parents or relentless fair, O oh, let me think it is not quite in vain To sigh out sonnets to the midnight air. Sweet hope, ethereal balm upon me shed, And wave thy silver pinions o'er my head. In the long vista of the years to roll, Let me not see our country's honour fade, Let me see our land retain her soul, Her pride, her freedom, and not freedom's shade. From thy bright eyes unusual brightness shed, Beneath thy pinions canopy my head. Let me not see the patriot's high bequest, Great liberty, how great in plain attire, with the base purple of a court oppressed, Bowing her head and ready to expire. But let me see thee stoop from heaven On wings that fill the skies with silver glitterings. And as in sparkling majesty A star gilds the bright summit of some gloomy cloud, Brightening the half-veiled face of heaven afar, So when dark thoughts my boding spirit shroud, Sweet hope, celestial influence round me shed, Waving thy silver pinions o'er my head. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.